This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 27 for April 2nd, 2009. From New York City, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm Dick DePommier. I'm Saul Silverstein. The three of us are here in New York. Uh, we don't know where Alan Dove is. Maybe he'll join us. But if not, we will proceed without him. We He's have... probably out eating one of his bars. <laughs> his bars? Dove bar. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> hey, I haven't been here in two weeks, okay? Give me a break. Well, he, he always has bad jokes. So That's true. That's you can true. have bad jokes, too. Dick, you were fishing, right? I was. Did you catch any? I did. Now, why would you want to fish for a bonefish, of all things? Oh, yeah. There are lots of fun to catch. They're, they're a challenge. And once you catch one, you want to catch another one. I had a great time. I was in Andros for a week, and the weather was perfect. The bone fishing was excellent. And we ate, slept, and fished the whole time. It was wonderful. Well, you have a tan, Dick. <laughs> yep, I do. You don't, Saul. <laughs> I wasn't out in the same. I should mention that joining us today is Saul Silverstein from Columbia, my colleague here, professor of microbiology, his third time around on TWIV. Thanks for coming back, Saul. Always a pleasure. Always something fun to talk about. Yeah, we have a great herpes story today, which we will get to. We have a few things to do first, besides make fun of Dick going bone fishing. <laughs> the first thing I want to tell everyone about relates to a story we covered I think last week, an Ebola virus needle stick. Were you here for that, Dick? No, no. I'm sorry, I wasn't. Uh, a young scientist in Germany had stuck herself with a needle yes. containing Ebola. She was inoculating animals in a German uh, BSL-4 laboratory. They decided to give her uh, an experimental vaccine, and apparently now she's okay. I got the latest update on uh, on this situation from uh, a, can a Canadian newspaper because they actually uh, supplied the vaccine someone in Canada. So she's okay. And we had discussed last time about what strain she had received because they didn't mention it. In this article, it is said that the strain that she injected herself with, they didn't identify, but it had previously killed a Russian scientist in a lab accident another time. So it was a lethal strain of the virus. But she's apparently okay. She has no virus in her. She's been checked uh, periodically. And in fact, this article says the needle, she actually didn't even push the plunger down on the needle. The, the needle itself actually just pierced her three gloves that she was wearing. So she might have not actually been infected, but it was good to be safe. So it looks Absolutely. like she's going to be okay. But, uh, would you have taken a, an experimental vaccine, Dick, if you had stuck yourself with well, Ebola? if there was no choice, I certainly would. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of the earlier incidents we described with loss of fever and how Jordi Casals actually caught loss of fever. Through his mouth, right? That's right. Through his mouth by petting. And then he was desperate for a cure, and Nurse Pinio's serum saved his life. So there's a rich, long history of all of this, unfortunately. And there will still be, because people make mistakes all the time. No question. There are always going to be lab accidents. That's right. Luis Villarreal said, you're working in a BSL-4 with animals, you're going to stick yourself. It's like people who draw blood from HIV-infected uh, uh, persons in the hospitals. There's going to be an accident, although the actual number of people who get infected is turning out to be quite small. Yes. And yet people who get a, a needle stick immediately get treated with antiretrovirals, too, right? yeah. which is the right thing to do. Sure. No, you have to. to take a chance. Sure. You have to be careful. It happens all the time. So that's good that she's all right. Best wishes. We'll get you on TWIV, and you can talk about it sometime, right? Sure. The next interesting story I found this week has to do with rabies virus. You guys know what a negri body is by I any do. chance? Yes. What's a negri body? Negri body is that little inclusion that occurs in, in ra rabies infected That's right. cells. That's do, you, right. do you know any other such bodies in virus infected cells? Well, herpes. Which, what's the name of that one? Well, it's um, in herpes, it's called, uh, the test is called a zonk stain after a uh, French dermatologist in the 40s who identified intranuclear inclusion bodies huh. in people who had active either chickenpox or herpes simplex, and it's used as a diagnostic. And, of course, measles has inclusion bodies, but they're not nuclear. Exactly. And that's how you differentiate. I think the uh, the herpes ones are called cowdery bodies, right? Uh, so I do know. And there's ones in pox virus infected cells. They're called guarnieri bodies. Uh -huh. You have to be Italian to name these. Uh, they negri, named a negri. violin after him also. <laughs> ne <laughs> violin. Negri was an Italian microbiologist who lived around 1900. 
and he found these things. And there was a paper in PLOS Pathogens this week. It was just amazing. It shows what these bodies are for. So they're usually pathonomic, right? You see these in a tissue sample. You say, aha, negri bodies. It's got to be rabies or cowdery or guarnieri. In this paper, which is from pathognomonic, I believe. What did I say? Pathognomonic. No, I didn't say that. (laughs) Pathognomonic. Pathognomonic. Did I say pathognomonic? Yeah, I don't know what you said, but Doesn't you didn't say pathognomonic. Pathognomonic. It means <laughs> it's uh, it's indicative of. Uh, the I didn't mean to correct you. No, you can correct me. Anything. <laughs> our, our listeners do all the time. What's the difference? <laughs> That's right. It's okay. Uh, in this paper, what they were doing, they were studying rabies infection of uh, cells in culture, and they were staining these cells with an antibody to a cell protein called toll-like receptor three, TLR three, which is a sensor. It's the one of the ways cells sense that a virus is present, and when they do sense it, they make interferon, which will then lead to an antiviral state. So they were just staining the cells, and they found that the TLR3 protein was clustering in perinuclear bodies. Wow. And they said, hmm, these look like Negri bodies. So it turns out that the TLR3 protein, which is normally a, a membrane protein, membrane mem- sure. is in these Negri bodies in rabies virus oh, we so do, we know, do we know how it's sequestered? No, we don't know the mechanism, but it must bind a viral component. Or maybe it suggests that there's an inversion of membrane that then includes the... It could be. I think it has something to do with endocytosis, in fact, yeah. yes. And they saw, they found in these Negri bodies, they found TLR3 viral RNA and viral proteins. Now, here's the cool thing. They silenced TLR3 with siRNA. Hmm. It knocks down rabies virus production. No. So these Negris huh. are needed for virus production. They're wow. probably factories like in the pox virus. And right. Wow. How cool is that? They need, to, they, they need to look and just do it. They could just do it with in-situ hybridization. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, demonstrate that virus is replicating yeah. in the sites. TLR3 must have an architectural role, or may have an architectural role, right, in these bodies. Because if you take it away, they don't form, actually. The Negri bodies don't form without TLR3. That's and you get much less virus repli- so replication. That, so that's actually the attractant of the nidus for formation. Exactly, for exactly. Formation of that. But what, how the virus does that and what, what it's elaborating to effect that is, is it's very an interesting, interesting. Problem. So it's a cool ob- observation i like Wait. this paper now the other possibility also is that now tlr3 is a sensor of rabies virus on the pla- on the membrane probably on the endocytic membrane so by taking tlr3 and, and putting it in the middle of these negri bodies it's effectively hiding it so it cannot sense infection so you don't you don't get a uh, an interferon response with rabies infection. right so they did this experiment they looked at mice lacking TLR3. They infect them with rabies. What do you think? Worse infection or better infection? Worse in terms of who? <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say, it's not clear what I'm asking I'm you. I'm thinking it's better for the mouse. Am I the virus better, or the virus? <laughs> it's better for the mouse. Mice lacking TLR3 are less susceptible to rabies virus infection. What's the biological consequence of missing your toll three receptors, though? But you take away uh, TLR three, the vi- there's less virus being made. Right now, you would I think it's counterintuitive because you're not signaling as much, you're not making as much interferon, so you would think that the infection would be worse. But since you're making less virus, right? So the body has a chance to fight the infection. It's much more successful. Right. Exactly. Because what you've done is essentially attenuated the virus. What right. else does it do, though? It must be doing something. Oh, in else. the long term, it's probably not a great thing. <laughs> right. I mean, you want you, you've just knocked out one of the arms of the innate immune response. Typically for CNS infections, it's better not to have these sensors. So West Nile in mice is much less lethal if you take away TLR3. That's interesting. Because you get this inflammatory response in the brain, which isn't good. Mm -hmm. But in general, if you have people without TLR3, it would be an issue. You would get a lot of infections, probably peripheral infections. But uh, I thought that Mr. Negri or Dr. Negri would like to have seen this paper, right? (laughs) Absolutely. Because he had these little blobs. Another another guy who's ahead of his time. (laughs) Now we know what they do (laughs) in part. But this is clear. You can see all the cool things that you could do here to find out what uh, what exactly this – protein is doing and how it's forming these bodies. Neat. Just with a little bit of antibodies and siRNAs. That's all you need. And clever thinking. Clever thinking. That's right. Now, gentlemen, I'm happy to say that we have a little uh, ad support now on TWIV from the fine folks at gotomypc.com. You know, it takes a long time for people to trust new technologies, right? Yes. Like many people used to be afraid of online banking. That's true. But now we love the convenience 
and we don't know what we'd do without it. Right, Dick? I, I feel that way, at least. I'm always recommending go to my PC, but if you haven't tried it because you're worried about security, I want to reassure you. Brought to you by Citrix, go to my PC is as secure as online banking. Everything is protected with state-of-the-art security features like end-to-end 128-bit encryption, so your data, your critical data, are always protected. I use it because I know it's completely secure. Hmm. Now, if you want to try it, you can try Go to My PC free for 30 days, but you must visit go to mypc.com slash podcast. That's go to mypc.com slash podcast, and you'll get a free 30-day trial. Try it out. It's quite interesting. Does this work with Apple users? It will work for Mac users, yes. You will be able to access your computer from anywhere in the world. Oh, that's I can nice. leave my computer running oh, yeah. here and access it from wherever I am without that's having to system. put a hole in the firewall. Oh, how excellent. You can that is say, nice. oh, I forgot that document, and you're in Rome. No problem. A couple of clicks, and you're here. Wow. Go to mypc.com slash podcast. <laughs> I'll do it. There. How about you, Saul? I'm there. <laughs> You're there. Excellent. Our next story, norovirus outbreak closes a small New England college. Norovirus. You ever hear of Babson College? Sure. Yeah. Yeah? It uh, has a good business. Yeah. Ever hear of Norwalk, Connecticut? <laughs> Was it Norwalk, Connecticut or Ohio? Nope. Norwalk, Connecticut. And that's someone, cor- someone, someone corrected Actress. us last time. Really? We might have said Ohio. Yeah. It's Norwalk, Connecticut. All right, That's maybe. who they named this virus after. Then they changed the name because Norwalk, Connecticut didn't like it. <laughs> you know, but the people of Lhasa haven't objected yet, and I, well. we haven't heard about Lyme yet, but I'm sure we will. <laughs> I got confused because when I heard of norovirus on ProMed, I thought a, a new virus had been discovered, and it turned out it's the new name for the old virus, Norwalk virus. So. All right, we'll take you. Not word a for pleasant, it. not a pleasant virus. Anyway, to they, clo- they closed this college for a few days because they had an outbreak. Several hundred kids were vomiting, diarrhea. That's right. It's, it's you an know, awful virus. This it's is a very 24 bad... hours of hell. Yeah, That's it right. Is. It's, a sh- it's also on ships, cruise ships. All the time. So how do, you, how do you get this infection, Dick? Well, I would imagine it's fecally contaminated. Right. It's an enteric virus. It's a proteinaceous virus, no membrane, very stable. It's a plus-stranded RNA virus, Dick. Is that what you know it that? is? Uh, it is I spread. knew that. I but knew on that. a cruise ship, Dick, <laughs> on a cruise ship, yeah. how, how would you get this infection? Well, if it's still fecal contamination, it's got to be food handlers. Food handlers, and... yeah. yeah. They're often asymptomatic shedders. So that's sure. probably what happened with this college. Is a food they have cafeteria. Sure. You get it in a couple of kids, and then that's what happens? Right. They don't wash their hands. They touch everything. Robert Robert Shope Sr., who I never knew, but uh, I, I occupied the same floor at Rockefeller that he was on, unfortunately died from pancreatic cancer, had a saying above his door, which was avoidable by everybody at Rockefeller because of what it said, mm-hmm. said the earth is covered with a thin layer of and and he actually had that in quotes. It is, and this is the proof. <laughs> further proof. <laughs> this is the further proof. That's right. The Bernie Madoffs of the world are <laughs> yeah. some the kind ba- of shit. The bacteria, the bacteria and viruses have certainly it's evolved amazing. to uh, rule the world, despite mm-hmm. everything we do. It's incredible. Absolutely. So why would they, why would they close the college? So that's a good Vent question. Spread. So how would the kids in class? They're going to well, contaminate each they're other. They're going to just they're just going to infect each other. All you've got to do is have somebody who. Uh, Goes to the bathroom, doesn't thoroughly wash the hands. They touch a doorknob, they touch the desktop, and you're left with the problem of having to decontaminate things. So, how long does the virus last in the environment if you didn't decontaminate? I'm not certain. I know the answer to that, but but what's clear is that you've got a population where this spreads rapidly, and uh, it's really relatively short but very unpleasant duration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all now going to be immune. Oh, they are? Okay, fine. Yeah. That's my other question. Was. So uh, they will elaborate an immune response rapidly, and they should become resistant. The problem is if, as Vince said, some of them become shedders, you have always the opportunity yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to keep moving it forward. But I imagine that's quite infrequent. The virions are very stable. They're very stable. In fact, you would predict that because they go through your gut. Yeah, sure. They do enter predominantly via the oral route, but listen to this. Indirect evidence from epi studies suggest Viruses can also enter via aerosols, such as those generated from explosive vomiting that occurs during this disease. Right. Yeah, we used, we used to call this winter vomiting disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's projectile day. vomiting. Yeah, so you get yeah. an aerosol. You can yeah. imagine a kid in a class throwing up, and then everybody's infected. So it's yeah. a good it's a good thing to 
close down close the spread. Absolutely. Yeah. Limit the spread. Columbia probably wouldn't close down because of something like this, do you think? Well, well it's a much larger entity. Yeah. Uh, a different story and perhaps much less sensitive some way to spend your spring break though huh <laughs> babson college the college president said you never know when you eradicate the virus <sighs> well informed i don't think uh, they will eradicate it so no. someone will bring yeah. it back this tends to be a winter disease it's quite interesting hmm. so it is seasonal like flu we don't know why. Perhaps like we'll find out pots. someday. Chicken pox so, is also seasonal. Yeah. Pretty much. If you catch it and get over it, you're immune for life or you're immune for the next season? or well, Probably for a while, how long it is. You know, a natural infection tends to give reasonable long-lasting immunity. We, we, always, we always forget about that because yep. we say, oh, I got another cold, but you probably just have yep. another rhino or adenovirus exactly. that you haven't been exposed exactly. to. Here we go, Dick. Immunity to noroviruses in humans is poorly understood, <laughs> but does not appear to resemble the pattern observed with most other viruses. So adults get repeatedly reinfected. Okay. So I thought about the other um, common virus that's transmitted like this, the uh, uh, rotavirus. And rotavirus is very, yes. very common throughout the tropics as well. And there's now a vaccine for it. Because they're worried about infant mortality rates and stuff like this. So here's another one to add to your list. Another good reason to vaccinate your child. Here, here. Of course, there isn't a norovirus vaccine yet, nope. but there might be one someday. Right. Problem is, I think the reason why we get reinfected as we get older is that mucosal immunity is what is protective here, but that wanes very quickly. Yeah. So you may have a good serum antibody, but uh, the, the gut has to be protected. Right. So you have no gamma A. That's where the disease uh -huh. occurs in the gut, and if you can't stop it there, you have a problem. But remember, the infectious poliovirus vaccines uh, make a great gut immunity, and they do protect against gut infection. So maybe we could piggyback. Use, piggyback, exactly. That'd be great. You, you see how we give away these ideas for free. Anybody out there listening who just wants to piggyback <laughs> a norovirus antigen onto the back of uh, polio, just go for it. And you can send us the royalties, by the way. <laughs> You have a checking account number you want to give out? Absolutely. It's in Switzerland, and I use it all the time. <laughs> you need the <laughs> That's right. Gentlemen, did you know that there is an outbreak of hand, foot, and mouth disease in China at the moment? Yes, I did know that. You did this. know that? I did. I follow ProMed. Uh, so, so far this year, 40,000 people infected, mostly kids, 18 yeah. deaths. Wow. Do you know what virus causes that, Dick? Alpha mouth virus. <laughs> so, I say that again? <laughs> You'll have to tell us. <laughs> You know that I don't know the answer to that. Why do you continually embarrass me on the air? Well, I'm not embarrassing you. We need a foil guy. Here. Well, I'm the one, of course. I show up. That's why I didn't come the last two weeks. That's you know? why you get paid. I had to go life. see my psychiatrist about is, this. Is that really why you don't show up? Because you're embarrassed? No, probably not. He's I, crying, folks. I actually have a lot of fun doing this. He's crying. All right, I'll ask you, Salt. Do you know what virus is? Not a clue. <laughs> See, he doesn't Thank mind. That he he doesn't used to mind. be the chairman of this department, and he doesn't know. Then he, he I, doesn't feel I feel better. I feel better already. All right. This is caused by a picornavirus, actually. A picornavirus? It, yeah. It's one of several. It can be Coxsackie viruses or enterovirus type 71. Really? Yeah. And, you know, this is a rash disease where the kids get a rash inside their mouth, tongue, cheek, inside of the cheeks, and also on the hands, palms, and on the base of the feet, hand, foot, and mouth disease. That's where the name comes from. It's an acute viral infection. It's spread by contact among you know, kids who don't wash their hands. They're playing right. outside. It's seasonal, just like uh, many picornavirus infections. So many of these things are, and we really don't understand no, we that. Don't. But, you know, I, I, it just got me back to thinking about when we talk about viability and, and longevity of some of these things on surfaces. And, of course, moisture is an important component. And as things desiccate, they become either inactive or, or or die because of mm -hmm. the result of the lack of a change in water and, mm -hmm. and uh, sublimation of the water from, from the entity. And that, of course, just, uh, Part just of it. knocks it out. Mm. Although, you know, with flu, the season uh, the seasonality has to do with the in humidity. When it's dry, the droplets that you expel tend to go farther. And in conditions of high humidity, That's they fall to the yeah, ground, sure. so they don't transmit sure. as effectively. Right. So but they're longer lives, so they get trade-offs here. Too. And so that's a, an envelope virus, so it's a different uh -huh. issue. So hoof and mouth and foot, hand and mouth. What's the... right, So foot and mouth disease is a cattle, a, a disease of yeah, cattle. Exactly, exactly. It's also a picornavirus. It's a picornavirus also. Yeah, but foot, it's nasty. FMDV, it's very, very nasty. nasty yeah. disease. It wipes out cattle. And yeah, you know, yeah. a few years ago, they had to kill millions of them in the UK to stop the infection. There's a lot of beef welling. <laughs> I think they that's burn true. it. Yeah, well, that's, 
A lot of well done be found. <laughs> uh, and this is hand, foot, and mouth disease, but the virus is either Coxsackie virus or Enterovirus 71. These 18 kids who died, this uh, not the Coxsackies, but the Entro 71 can go into the CNS. Ah. And so that's gotcha. what that's what kills these kids. And in this outbreak, they've isolated Entro 71 from these kids, some of them. So, Do people in this country die from Coxsackie virus? Some young, very young kids may die really? disseminated infections. Very it's quite rare, but uh, the very young kids with a poor immune response, they can get disseminated infections. There are millions of enterovirus infections a year in the U.S. Sure. Most of them are asymptomatic, but oh, there are some consequences. We have this rash disease in the U.S., uh, and occasionally it is fatal. I should point out there are no vaccines. There are no antivirals. Mm. Not many people work on these viruses, but they seem to be emerging as pretty significant pathogens yep. Yep, yep, uh, yep. in um, much of the world. So maybe people will begin to work on them. Maybe I should. <laughs> I was close. I worked on type 70. Well, you were within one. I was within one. <laughs> I missed it. One and done. Before we go on to this uh, story on herpes viruses, let's have a word from... Another one of our sponsors, the American Society for Microbiology. On May 17th through the 21st at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, the American Society for Microbiology will hold its 109th general meeting, the largest annual gathering of microbiologists in the world. Visit the general meeting website at gm.asm.org to view the preliminary program, register for the meeting, or reserve your hotel stay. That's gm.asm.org. All right, we have a nice paper for Saul to tell us all about today called De Novo Synthesis of VP16 Coordinates the Exit from Herpes Simplex Virus Latency in Vivo. This is a PLOS Pathogens paper. Very cool paper. But what is latency, Saul? Latency is a state in which a virus lives within a cell and elaborates either a limited amount of its genetic information, or virtually none. And so what it's doing is coexisting with its host and not actively replicating. It's not undergoing a lytic infection. It's not producing new viral progeny. And it coexists for some period of time. And for some reason or another, we don't really understand the mechanisms by which this happened. Viruses such as human papillomaviruses, human herpes viruses, and probably other viruses, adenos included, are reactivated. And what happens is they enter a lytic cycle, produce progeny, exit the cell from which uh, they reside, and kill the cell in that process, of course, and can either infect surrounding tissue or sometimes they are just uh, released from the body and, and with, it, with no apparent infection. So in the case of herpes simplex, when do you get first infection? Infected? Usually by the time you're 10 years old, there's some evidence of having had a, mm -hmm. a primary type 1 infection. What kind of transmission transmits the virus? Well, uh, it's my suspicion it's mostly um, aerosol. Mm -hmm. Could there's you catch a, this at birth from yes, your mother? Yes, there's, there's no question about the fact that children emerging from uh, the birth canal can be infected with herpes virus, either type 1 or type 2. And those kids, if the mother has undergone appropriate surveillance, uh, they're treated with uh, acyclovir or one of the other what is the term for that? You know, you use congenital transmission, but that's not congenital, is no, it? No, it's not really. It's We don't have a term for it. I think what's we need why, a term for What's that. wrong with congenital? Because that's acquired in utero. Oh, this is upon birth. This, this yes. is upon birth. Okay. That's like rubella would be in utero. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, CMV infections can occur in utero. That's another herpes virus, but sure. a, different, a different family of the herpes exactly. virus. But this the beta herpes virus. At birth. The protozoan trichomonas can be acquired through birth of uh, newborn girls, and the vaginal tract can become infected at birth by simply mm -hmm. the act of birth. So, so we, we don't have a term, don't have a term for, for that? acquisition of disease at the time of birth. Either that or we just don't know. I, I mean, I, anybody out there that knows that term, we would tell deeply us. appreciate we'll, we'll learning it. So when you get this first infection, that's your primary... That's your primary you infection. Get, you, get a, you get a blister or a rash? Usually what happens is you get a lesion, which Where? crusts Mouth over. Mouth or genitals? It can be... If it's type 2 herpes, it's genital. If it's type 1, it's okay. oral. Sometimes type 1 goes with type 2 goes. <laughs> but that's for another discussion. Oh, exactly. And uh, then... And how does that work, Saul? <laughs> <laughs> that's another discussion. This is a non-explicit podcast. Right. 
Let me ask you one more thing. I'm sorry to interrupt so many times. We have to explain this really well to our listeners, and you'll see why when I read one of the emails. <laughs> what happened? So you said now we go into this latent period. What is the genome a circle in the cell, or is it yes, integrated? It is. It's there's a every, circle. There's every evidence that it's an extra chromosomal circle, mm -hmm. and that there's more than one copy of the virus DNA in an infected okay. neuron. And that that in and of, uh, in and of itself is a very interesting ah neurons. Issue. That's what neurons. Right. So it always goes to neurons for always this latency. Goes to neurons. For herpes simplex, for varicella zoster virus, and for probably also for the equine viruses that are related, and pseudorabies virus, the porcine virus. But your primary infections are epithelial cells, right? Your primary infections are epithelial cells. So what and makes neurons so susceptible? Why can't they respond like ordinary cells? Well, that's one of the things that we have to get into when we talk about this paper. So this is all about the reactivation in the neurons. Right. So let's, let's step back a minute and let's get our primary infection. Because um, as I used to teach the medical students, herpes is forever. Unlike? Well... Unlike love, right? True. Unlike love or marriage or <laughs> That's poliovirus, right. it's gone. Those That's things right. frequently leave you. Although Tax you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can shed for for a long time with right. with, um, with polio. But you, sh you can shed herpes also asymptomatically. But that requires having established the latent state. And before you can do that, you have to have that primary infection. Right. You infect cells in the epithelium, and then you remember that the epithelium is a complex organ, your skin, and you have epithelial cells, and then underneath it you have the dermis, and that's another composite. You'll never guess how Saul knows all this. <laughs> you have another <laughs> composite cell, cell layer, and these are highly innervated areas of your body. And by that I mean there are a lot of uh, neural dendrites that end in the skin, and you know that because if you touch something hot or if you get smacked on your arm, you feel pain. And so the, these dendrites uh, are termini for long axons that extend to your spinal cord and the various ganglia. And they serve as a platform for virus that is replicated in the epithelial tissue to enter the neural system. Mm. And from there, very interesting things occur. These viruses find a way to transit, retrograde up, the axon, get to the nucleus, and what's very clear now is that there must be some limited replication in the ganglia. There are a whole bunch of issues that you have to discuss when you, when you think about this, and they include the fact that when these viruses replicate, they kill the cell that they replicated. They're clearly not killing all of the cell. The other thing is that it's possible that what they do is they undergo an abortive infection. And you're talking about in the neurons in now, In the neurons. Right? Mm -hmm. And maybe some of them get into neurons, replicate, kill them. During this primary round of infection, it appears that the virus can spread within the ganglia. Mm -hmm. That may be because a substantive amount of new virus is made. And the thing that initiates virus infection is really a very, very interesting molecule that's associated with the virion itself. And it's, if you remember from our herpes virus podcast, and for those of you who didn't make it to that event, <laughs> herpes viruses are very complicated little things. And what they have is a nucleocapsid, which is a protein component that surrounds the virus genome. And packed inside that nucleocapsid is a single molecule of DNA and a bunch of host proteins, uh, mostly polyamines, to neutralize the DNA and help it pack in. Then surrounding the nucleocapsid is an electron dense is an electron dense Alan Dove. <laughs> is that you, Alan? Am I electron dense? You are now. Uh, we are about uh, halfway through. Halfway through, but Saul is just telling about us about electron density. So um, surrounding this nucleocapsid is this electron dense layer that was termed the tegument, and it was first uh, described by. Furlong and Roisman, a very, very long time ago. What is there? You can sort of ask yourself, what would you like to be there? <laughs> and there are a whole bunch of virus proteins that form probably very important protein-protein interactions, which have subsequent roles when the virus infects the cell. 
And I'm just going to just go to the next layer, which is the virus membrane, so that you have, have a, a full view of the virus. And we have that membrane, which has its um, glycoproteins on the outside, which serve as the ligands for cell receptors. Then we have that tegument and then nucleocapsid. But in the tegument is a wonderful protein. Actually, there are two wonderful proteins, one which I love, which is called VHS for Vera and Host Shutoff, which was the first series of experiments I did when I came to Columbia. And uh, I'm proud to say that that spawned a whole field that I left immediately <laughs> and went on to do something else. <laughs> but, but that's an intriguing molecule because what that does is it destroys host cell RNA when you enter the cell. And that helps to tip the balance wow. towards the virus. But the other molecule, which is even more fascinating, is called VP16 or alpha-TIF for trans-inducing fat. And VP16 was first described uh, by two groups. Chris Preston in uh, the UK and Bernard Breusman's group uh, in Chicago. And they identified this cell specific factor as being required to initiate the virus replication cycle. And what I mean by cell specific factor is that VP16 enters into the host cell. It actually enters with VHS. They seem to be complex in a very pretty series of studies done by. Uh, Jim Smiley showed that. But VP16 then subsequently is released, and it interacts with a host protein called HCS, CF, host cell factor. And Christy uh, was the first to describe that in some detail and isolate it, and we'll get on to that in a bit. And then these guys come into the viral replication cycle by entering the nucleus and interacting with OCT1, a ubiquitous cell protein, which has a DNA binding um, motif, and they form a ternary complex. So there's HCF, VP16, OCT1, and viral DNA. And it's that formation of that complex which initiates the virus replication cycle. And it turns on what are called the immediate early genes. And the virus can replicate without it, but it doesn't do it really, really well without, without VP16. So you can make viruses that lack the 16 gene, but they're very sick. Right. They're very sick and they replicate right. very poorly. And some of the ways of getting around that replication block are to treat cells with a drug called HMBA, hexamethylene betacetamide, which is a gratuitous inducer of all sorts of different things, or to put it in certain cell lines. And there's a very interesting cell line called U2OSL, which will complement this activity. The other thing that we know and I haven't really put this all together in this story because I'm not sure where it fits, is that the host cell has a protein that's a mimetic of VP16. It's probably really the other way around, mm. but that's, <laughs> that's another story. And this protein called Lumen, which was discovered uh, uh, by, I think it's BK Misra, uh, somewhere in Canada from one of the Canadian universities, it plays a similar role. So we have... Uh, it's always true that what the virus is doing is mimicking something that the host has or subverting or subjugating something. And that's clearly what happens at the very initial stages of infection. And that's where this story begins. This story begins with the fact that for 25 years, we've been trying to understand what happens when you scarify a mouse's eye, the cornea, drop in a little bit of herpes simplex virus. The virus replicates locally. There's inflammation, there's an immune response, all the good things. Or it doesn't even have to replicate. It'll find its way into those dendrites that innervate the cornea. And then go back, in the case of it's the eye, the trigeminal nerve. So the virus has now established latency in the trigeminal nerve. We know that for replication-competent virus, there is limited replication in the trigeminal nerve for a couple of days, then replication stops. At that point... You can no longer take that trigeminal nerve, dissociate it, and titrate infectious virus particles. But DNA is still there. DNA is still there. And there's Viral lots DNA. of copies. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the replication capacity of the virus, if it's fully replication competent, you have larger number of genomes per cell and more neurons infected. If it's a poorly replicating virus, then you have very low uh, numbers of infected neurons. And the people who did this work, Richard Thompson and Nancy Sautel, have been doing this for about 20 years or so. 
and they really have uh, gone against the grain, and damn if they ain't right. <laughs> and that's so cool. That's really, really cool. So the mouse is a model, but models require that you recapitulate everything that occurs in vivo. So let's just run through that. You infect the animal, you get latency, you reactivate. Oh, mice don't reactivate. Uh -huh. That's a problem. So what's been done over the years, and again, something that's accepted by some and not by others, and we can go into that in a little more detail if you like, because there's a rabbit model where the virus does reactivate, but it's much more difficult to control. And they axatomize the neuron, the nerve. What does that mean? Well, it means they cut it and they take it out, dissociate it into a, into a, a dish, and they put it on a fetal layer of cells or they uh, give it growth medium. And, oh, you get virus out. How long does that take? A couple of days. But they can, they can see it fairly rapid. So just the process of cutting out the nerve and putting it in culture reactivates. Yes. Now, in people, when you have a latent herpes, uh, how, do you, how does it get reactivated? Well, what, well, what stimulates the so, reactivation? <laughs> so what we know, and of course this is all, it's not carefully controlled, but we know that people under stress, hormonal changes, so frequently associated with menstruation, people who are exposed to sunlight, drink a lot of uh, orange juice, or frequently yeah. people who get recurrent lesions. We call those cold sores. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. And we know that there are also asymptomatic shudders, but we don't understand that process, although it may reflect this. So stress is a common um, initiator for reactivation. Do you think there are interleukins involved in all this? I don't know enough about what goes on in the brain, certainly not mine, <laughs> um, to, be, to be able to elaborate on that. But I, I, I don't think they play a role. I think what you're looking at is a very specific cellular response to stress whatever form it takes that results in a change in the cell dynamic, the host cell dynamic, and allows for reactivation. The virus isn't doing it by itself. And over the years, we have uh, said that this protein is important, that, that protein is important. And yeah, they are important, but they're not important, as it turns out, for reactivation. They're important for replication in the neuron. And when you reactivate, you only get a low level of virus made. Right. Here's why I asked you that, because with toxoplasma in the brain, it does have a dormant stage that's kept in check by interleukin-12. And when you get HIV infection, which down-regulates interleukin-12, up comes toxoplasma. Yeah. So I thought maybe there might be a connection. Well, we know that we know that immuno... Here. Well, anybody who's immunocompromised has a much higher incidence of recurrence. Exactly. And that's true for, but that's true for almost any virus infection, right. or for TB, or for anything else. So, the, the, those are just. Uh, but it, this is a maddening story, though, because if you have herpes, you're going to get it again and again. Like you said, it's forever, well, and and you don't even control your own emotional levels at times. And no, uh, but one of result, the one of the things that this does is it begins to explain for us what's involved in this reactivation pathway. So. Thompson and Sautel, over the last few years, have begun to challenge the premise that certain virus gene products, one called ICP0, one of my favorite proteins, because I've spent 25 years of my life working on it in one way, shape, or form, and virus DNA re replication were required to effectively reactivate. Well, what we know is that neither of those things is true, and... What I mean by reactivate is that we can measure expression of herpes simplex virus protein in neurons. Now, how do they do that? It turns out that you can stress a mouse by immersing it in a 43-degree wa uh, water bath, and that within a period of a couple of hours, I think it's about 22 hours, so this is hyperthermic shock, which is the treatment that they used, uh, you can demonstrate reactivation. So these are mice that have been already infected before. Right. They, they, they're now latently, the genomes are there. It's 40 days after they've right. been infected. You put them in a water bath. It's just like being in the ark, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they it, stick them in a water bath, probably keep their heads above water because that would keep the little guys from drowning, uh, measure their, their temperature with a rectal probe. And when they reach a certain temperature, then they've been a heat shock. Then after a period of time, they shock. 
Right. Mm. After that, they... Mm. Maybe heat shock proteins play a role here. Well, heat shock proteins or stress proteins because oh, heat shock proteins... Same, I guess. Yeah, they are. Heat shock is a, is a, yeah. uh, a catch base yeah, right. for a whole bunch of yeah, things. Yeah, sure, sure. And for a long time, we've known that, that heat shock proteins are intimately involved in a bunch of virus pro- processes. And there are studies from the early 80s by um, Latang and Latchman who showed that they were involved in, in regulation of virus gene expression in herpes-infected cells. But what they've done that's unique is to ask the question, what virus gene product gets turned on? This is using this mouse hypothermia model. So Hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. If you do the explant model, just to recapitulate what you said, what you find is that VP16 is not needed for reactivation. Correct. Nor is ICP0. Correct. Now, both of them help, Yes. but they're not obligatorily necessary. So, Because if you take each of those away and DNA replication, you right. still will get... Production of infectious virus in these cultures of explanted neurons. Right, well, not right? not DNA replication. They got to replicate the virus to get okay. the virus production. Just zero and sixteen. Right, but what they've done is uh, one of the things that we know, and this is a series of studies by a guy by the name of Richard Tenser, and also in the eighties at at, uh, at Hershey Medical Center, is that if you remove the thymidine kinase gene, my favorite gene, from simplex, and you establish latency that it reactivated very poorly, and it reactivates poorly because neurons don't synthesize DNA. So they don't have all of the enzymatic machinery that's poised to do okay. this. So TK is needed for so DNA, TK, viral DNA synthesis. Right, so they're not, okay. they're not making nucleotides. Got it. So it's important to have TK for that. But here we have a situation where they've gone ahead and heat shocked these little guys and infected them with viruses that either have mutations in VP16 or lack VP16, or have fusions, reported genes, which have a VP16 promoter hooked up to beta-gal, so they can look for beta-gal activity in situ, in vivo. And they start this whole series of experiments by asking the question, what is the VP16? What makes the VP16 promoter unique, or is it unique? It's a member of a family of virus genes that are only expressed at late times during a lytic infection, right? So they're only made after DNA replication. Mm -hmm. So they took another promoter of the same class that encodes a major capsid antigen called VP5, and they switched. And they made a mouse that did this, and they asked the question, well, does it get turned on? And the answer is, it doesn't. So it's only the VP16 gene product with its own promoter that gets activated. And if you put the lactose Z fusion into a virus, put that inside the animal, shock the animal, then you've got all these blue cells because they're making lack Z. And that's using a VP16 promoter. Right. So, so that shows that as soon as you shock them, this protein is made, which we didn't think would nope. happen from the cell culture results, right? right? The cell culture results say, here's the order. So the question is, why is that? And remember that in the cell culture experiments, we put the virus in, the virus brings in VP16. That serves to act in the latently infected neuron. That herpes virus genome is already inside the nucleus. What's missing? About 10 years ago, Christian Sears, after Christy left, uh, went from Roisman to Phil Sharp and then went to uh, the NIH where he's been since, showed that in sensory neurons, the host cell factor is present in the Golgi apparatus. It's not in the nucleus. Well, if it's not in the nucleus, herpes can't replicate. Very interesting. Ah. Very. Mm-hmm. And that's what could turn on VP16. <laughs> well, so here's, here's, here's the chicken and egg story. Remember that HCF works with VP16 I see. to initiate the cascade. Mm-hmm. What's unique about VP16 in the neuron? And only in the neuron, because when you look in infected cells in culture, you don't see VP16 being turned on at early times post-infection. You don't see it turned on in the absence of DNA synthesis. You don't see it activated. That is, the transcripts made in the presence of cyclohexamide. So something is different. And that means that there's either a repressor that is being relieved as a result of the heat shock or a microRNA that's blocking virus gene expression. 
something that's modulating expression from this gene cassette. And one of the things that we know is that if you stress a neuron, you can move HCF into the nucleus, but we ha have no idea huh. whether or not HCF is involved in activating BP16. So there are a lot of interesting questions that this, sure. that this study has um, identified, and there's certainly going to be things that uh, we're going to want to investigate. We're going to want to know what's the molecular basis for this change in programming, if you will, this programmatic shift. And uh, we're going to want to know what it is that the host does to respond to stress that has this unfortunate consequence. Right. So the, the bottom line here is that in a mouse, BP16 is essential for reactivation. Yes. If you take it away, it can't reactivate. Right. They don't when, react. it's, when it's present, when the gene is present, we know that upon stress, it's this protein is made early on, and that's what we have to, one of the things we have to figure Absolutely. out, right? We don't know how that happens. And then the other moral of the story, of course, is that putting these neurons in cultures is completely artificial. <laughs> and you all, you all, caveat emptor, you always have to remember what you're doing. Sure. When you take the neurons out of the, out of the body of the animal, they're in a totally different state. They're not buffered in the same way. They're not packed with the same density inside a ganglia. And they're exposed to all sorts of growth factors and things that you uh, put in the medium, which they're probably not exposed to. So when you, the, another nice part of this is that when you're working with the system for years and years, you, you don't even you, you fail to remember these things, and you think this is the dogma what we're learning from this. Well, and it takes like, someone who is willing to to go against that, as you I said. Mean, they've been challenging this system religiously now for about probably almost ten years. They've done some of the best work in terms of showing that there are correlations between the number of uh, virus genomes that replicate and the infectivity of the virus and its ability to establish latency and the ability to reactivate. One of the really, really interesting things that, that you always have to think about this, and I've mentioned it already, is the fact you reactivate. Where does that virus go? Because you don't really often find necrosis in the ganglia. Ah. If people get numb, yeah. maybe there's a little bit of local replication, but it doesn't replicate there. It's going out and it's shooting its way down. Well, you have to make some virus in the neural body now. Right. Absolutely. So, and it's got a, a but, but how interesting that it, it's only leaving through the axon mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. little of it through the, the neuron body that's in contact with all the other neurons. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. So, and also we don't think the neuron in which it reactivates probably doesn't get killed, right? Oh, I bet that one dies. That one dies? I bet that one but dies. But there are others with genomes still. Right. There are others around it with genomes still that are not activated. So now uh, there's another question. What's different about this genome from the one in the adjacent cell? And is it a fact that all neurons don't respond synchronously? Is it a fact, and they suggest that there's some sort of stochastic process, a random process, which um, reactivates? Or is it something about the fact that neurons have a, um, a cyclical nature, perhaps, wherein a portion of the neurons are available for activation at some time and others aren't? And so these are really important questions, and I, yeah. I think that they're just poised to tip the balance on this. That's really... This is just a, it's a great paper. So in all the years that they've been pushing against the field, what has been the reaction of the field to them? Were they basically not believed or not taken seriously or not sure how to, what to make of it? I think it's a, we're not sure what to make of it because nobody has done it the way they've done it. Mm. And they've done the direct comparisons now that really challenge all the stuff that comes from explants. And there are a lot of, really elegant and lovely experiments, and we've learned quite a bit from using the explant model. But what we know is that it's relevant to a point. Sure. And sure. not 100%. When you go back and you look in vivo, even in an animal that doesn't really reactivate well, you get a different story. And so now we know, as Paul Harvey would say, now we know the rest of the story, but not quite. What we have, what we have is an entree into the rest of the story now. Because you have a, another question to answer, that's true. Yeah, a lot of questions. So, you know, it would also raise the question of whether or not a neuron is susceptible or not as to whether it's in the process of firing at the moment of infection. We don't, we don't, you know, don't know. You don't know. You don't know. So don't know it could account for the differences, perhaps. Sure. 
absolutely. But these are these are open questions, and and this is a book that is uh, yet to be written. Are you going to participate in the writing? Hell no. No, you're, you're, you're done. Huh? I'm done. Right. Yeah, we'll see about that. Yeah, so, maybe. if you had to make a long <laughs> list and a short list of important neurotropic agents and include everything here, what would your short list look like? Oh, gee, that's an interesting question. You know, you you always think about the little guy, like like the PMLs and, and JC viruses that we're learning more and more about as we see some degree of immune comp- compromise compromisation. That's a word. <laughs> And, <laughs> Close enough, <laughs> and and these things elaborating themselves um, in in the MS patients that have been treated with these uh, antibodies. Uh, uh, certainly, the herpes viruses are fascinating in terms of what they do to us and how they recur. Rabies, yep. but of course, if you That's get right. rabies and you don't get uh, 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 the vaccine, you don't have to worry about that for too right. long. <laughs> I think that the list goes on. We have parasites, we have bacteria, encephalitis virus, we have yeah. the encephalitides, all of sure. these things that find a, a I mean, route into into the brain. T. cruzi occurs to me as one of these agents also that has selectivity for ganglia and uh, my enteric plexus and this sort of thing, and um, for other cells too. I mean, it's a more mm-hmm. generalist, sure. but it certainly does infect the my enteric plexus of the gut tract and uh, has a severe, terrible, terrible dissemination effect on that. Just awful stuff. So, you know, neurotropisms, uh, they are neglected probably because it's so difficult to work in well, vivo. the problem is today we can begin to think about doing studies in vivo because we have all this wonderful imaging technology. Yes. In order to avail yourself of this, you now have to build the appropriate test animal right. that has your proteins of yeah, interest. Yeah, 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 yeah labeled in a way that you can follow them. And after a while, what you end up doing is looking at the rainbow. That's a tough problem. And um, I mean, it's, it's a dynamic not, cell. The, it's not a, trivial. A neuron is a cell which is dormant until it's activated. That's I think of muscle cells this way too, and several other kinds of cells. But all the other cell types that I'm, I'm you know, ima- imagining, like all the dermal cell types and all the, the, the scaffolding cells that you have, the fibroblasts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, have generalist functions that probably are on most of the time and then you know you have these other specialized cells that you've got to deal with as ecological units for infection basically that's what i'm driving at is that the ecology of your body in terms of what's available and what's not in terms of an, an invader it's an opportunist very much so and we understand so little about uh, yeah the nervous system still i mean vince's point is absolutely perfect that you can make it do anything you want in vitro you come back in vivo and try to make that correlation it's totally different. And it may be even irrelevant what goes on in vivo. In vivo, in vitro, rather. Well, it, it, what it does is it makes you aware of how false some of our premises are. Absolutely. And the hypotheses that, that we make yeah, are based right. on what's essentially soft data yep. because we don't have uh, well, the wherewithal to pursue it. It's it's the looking for your watch under the wrong <laughs> Well, you know, I we used to do... We do experiments with polio and neuroblastoma cell lines, and now I realize this is it's not even a neuron in right. culture. It's right. a cancer cell. Yeah, it's yeah. some markers. That's right. And then I was thinking we should make primary cultures of neurons, but now <laughs> we can see that they're probably not appropriate either. Yeah, the, the, I think the architecture of where they live is major for how this comes out in humans. Yeah. I'm but sure they, it's part of the response of, of, of the neurons as well. It's it's yeah. nearest neighbor yeah. analysis, yeah, yeah, if you yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You transmit signals between cells and and sure. along pathways that we don't fully understand, and you end up getting uh, uh, these kinds of very interesting well, observations. Neuro- neuro- neurobiologists are very good at stimulating individual neurons. Very good at this. Have anyone worked with a neurologist, <laughs> a neurobiologist, to say, okay, I know this virus is in that cell. Stimulate it and see what happens. See if it becomes, it loses its latency and comes into a. Mm-hmm. Well, of co- well, of course, here's the problem: we don't know that the virus, which cell the virus is in right. at this juncture. Fluorescent green protein. Can Fluorescent tell you green that. protein is great if you've got something yeah. that's on. Yeah. But in latently mm-hmm. infected cells, unless it's varicella, where you do have things on, if it's simplex, nothing's on. No, but you could you- attach it to the lat promoter, this latency-associated transcript, which we still don't understand. And maybe that would give you signal for a long enough period of time so that you could find it. But it's it's difficult. And you remember okay. that within a, right. within a neural ganglia, only a percentage of the cells, yeah. only a percentage of the neurons are actually infected. Right. Not all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Nice idea, but... 
Let's start rethinking this. How can we tag circles of DNA without affecting their replication rate? Yeah, that's it. Figure it out. Then you can announce it on Twiv and let someone <laughs> capitalize on it. That's right. right. Let them do the experiment. Okay. No, that's good. Someone out there will defy as a way to do this. I know they will. Of course. Because once you can identify the cell that's latent and stimulate it with an electrical signal, yep. you can say whether or not activation of the neuron is essential for right. the yeah. loss of latency. Right. Precisely. That's, so, that's not bad for a non-virologist here, that's kids. Why we have, that's why we have you on the show. <laughs> we always need a foil. We tolerate you because... Now do we? That. This is fantastic, though, <laughs> because with with the raw data that you've presented, you can take it to the next step. Absolutely. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to stimulate our audience to take this stuff to the next step. Absolutely. So no, they, I, want, I want all of you to go out there and make cDNA libraries <laughs> from heat-shocked animals, from neurons of heat-shocked animals, <laughs> Put those into cells and see if it affects a change. Now the problem is, my wife's going to ask what this what this is going to do to the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you may you may have to clean up afterwards. Again. <laughs> well, she is, but a, it's not uh, that trivial. She is a brain person, so she yeah. might, yes, she yes. might understand. Uh, it's okay. Saul's <laughs> wife is a skin person, so that's that's. I presume that's where you got your dermal data from. <laughs> I think he probably knew it before. Huh? I'm sure Just he did. I'm sure he did. I'm sure but he did. but the, the problem is not as trivial as that. No, because no. Because what cell do you put it in? Yeah. That's right. To test it. Yeah. Because the other cells. You know, it also or, raises or, the or, question. Or, although, actually, it's, actually, I take it back. It's it's pretty easy. Because this promoter isn't on. It's on at extraordinarily v low. VP16? Yeah, it's on at very low levels of normal cells. Extremely low levels. So you could do something so about that. So you could find something that. If, if it's an activator, sure. you could do that test. Or even if it's something that removes a, uh, a cell repressor. Right. So if you made a transgenic mouse with VP16 expressed in neurons, you would never have latency. Interesting question. Could the cell survive? So it might not survive. That's the problem. Expressing v VP16 is a very potent transcriptional activator. Yeah, it might, it might turn and on it cell might genes. screw things up. Although... You could, you could have it turned on at will. You could... Right, you know, but but rem rem remember, well, and then induce uh, lytic cycle. Yeah, by but doing remember that, right? that in mm. neurons, HCF is in the cytoplasm, right? In the so, Golgi. So will this guy work or not? Is there a way it? you could have the transgene turned on in response to virus infection? Well, that's isn't that an interesting question? Hmm. These I and tried. other burning questions of our time will be answered next week on maybe. This Week in Virology. <laughs> maybe maybe. <laughs> sounds like Dick wants to go home. Nope, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. We've only given Alan half an hour, so he deserves another half That's right, yes. And, an hour. and for those of you who uh, are wondering what this other voice is coming in, if Vince said it's <laughs> out my entrance, I, uh, I thought the show was starting taping a half hour later, so I've just joined the show, and this is Alan Dove in Western Massachusetts. I'm sorry. Sorry, it's, it's my fault, Alan. No, that's quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was great. Great paper, and we will put a link in, and that's what makes journal, it great. The Journal Club part it of the makes show. It, sometimes it makes it a great paper is that it is seminal, and yep. this is the beginning of a lot. Yep. Let's do a few emails here, gentlemen, hey, shall we? You bet. Ricardo writes, great podcast. As a microbiology teacher, I see lots of good information, and a lot of it wrapped in very good stories, very nice for teaching. I guess the stories are, are your parts. <laughs> Alfred writes, great podcast, look forward to it every week. As a practicing doc who who learned most of his cellular chemistry back before you got your PhDs. I'm not as up-to-date on the inner workings of nucleic acids. It would be helpful if you could do a show reviewing some of the more technical terms you guys use. Alternatively, if you just gave a sentence explaining what the terms meant, it would greatly help someone who thinks a promoter segment is someplace for the managers of professional boxers to hang out. Arg. So, promoter. What is a promoter, Saul? Promoter is a region... Uh, within a gene, in front of a gene, that serves as a gathering point for cell proteins to initiate transcription. In other words, to get initiate gene expression and make new RNAs. Right. Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We do tend to just move through these things quickly. It's a highly jargonized science. Yeah, we have to try and... We have a very varied audience, so we'll try and do better. Right. Maybe if we don't, we'll put a definition in the show notes. Here, here. 
A few episodes back, you mentioned that chloroquine was found to inhibit a particular viral enzyme or protein that was found in some viruses, including the Ebola family. Since the locations for Ebola and malaria overlap, there must have been periods during Ebola outbreaks when humans were taking chloroquine for malaria. It should be possible to look back and see if those individuals had a lower incidence of Ebola infection or lower death rates. Even if individual patients could not be identified, it might be possible to compare the size of Ebola outbreaks in areas with varying prevalences of malaria on the assumption that areas with higher malaria infections had higher numbers of humans taking chloroquine. Keep up the good work. What do you think of that? It's a very interesting hypothesis. Extraordinarily difficult to test because I'm sure, A, there are no records for most of those things. Right. And B, the Ebola outbreaks tend to be very small. They are small. They're very self-limiting. Right. So you, one of the things that, that would preclude doing a thorough analysis is numbers. You just can't do I, the epi. I agree. The numbers of Ebolas are too small. But just in case, I did, I did do a Google for malaria and Ebola. And I found a letter in a Journal of Travel Medicine. You know that, you know that Dick? I do, actually. From a physician from Belgium who went to Zaire to help out in, e- in an Ebola outbreak. And before he went, he took chloroquine before he went. No, mefloquine. Mefloquine. Wow, that's a derivative And so that's chloroquine. interesting that he was going to Ebola infected area and he was taking mefloquine. And he just talks about how he had psych- psychogenic uh, activity <laughs> with this drug. And he said, persons with a history of neuropsychiatric illness should not use mefloquine as malaria <laughs> prophylaxis. But the point is, when you send physicians in, you give them these anti-malarials, and that may protect them. Yep. But yeah, the epidemiology would be really hard. And also, in in Africa, where you see most of these Ebola outbreaks to the extent that they are occurring, um, isn't there a lot of chloroquine resistance in any case? Sure, absolutely. We don't use it anymore. You'd be taking some other um, some other malaria preventive anyway. Yeah, That's chlor- right. Chloroquine is back being used in the Far East, but I... I think not in Africa. Out of desperation more than... No, 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 no. They're susceptible. Again, there seems to be some... Reversal? So you don't come to Friday seminars. <laughs> <laughs> what are they using now? They don't come to, to your Friday seminars. <laughs> what are they using now for malaria? Day? Oh, no. Why, why do they start with quinine if you're awake? Plus a lot of antibiotics like uh, uh, clindamycin or tetracycline. Well, and the artemisin. artemisin. And artemisin, right. too. Artemisin. That's right. And, uh, there's some evidence that there's resistance now to yes, artemisin. Yes, there is now. Well, the, we have so far two examples of anti-malarials now inhibiting different viruses. So uh, we were speculating on that last time. Yeah. And we had an email. Megan writes, Hello, Twiv. I have commented before, but I wanted to thank you again for the great podcast. I look forward to listening every week. I just wanted to comment on the anti-malaria drug discussion and sp- expand a bit on the broadness of these drugs against other viruses. I have attached two interesting papers on the topic. The first is on an anti-malaria drug, art- artesunate. Yeah, it's close enough which was shown to block CMV replication. And the second is a review article discussing the broad coverage of artemisinin and artesunate. So thank you. That's great. I hadn't seen those. So apparently it's broader than we think. It's very interesting that there's this big intersection. Well, look at Suramin. Remember Suramin? Yes. Yeah. You know what that was originally used for? What? It was used for onchocerciasis. And it was also used for trypanosomiasis. And they discovered in the interim that it was good for HIV, HIV, at least in vitro. But it's, is it not used much? It's very it? toxic no, drug. Very, very toxic drug. All right. Okay, so we'll save the rest of our emails, and there are many of them for next time because we have to wrap it up. Uh, we have to end up with our picks of the week. Hey, Dick, you got any picks of the week? I'd go to the Andros Bonefish Club for a week. I'd recommend that as my pick for the week. <laughs> <laughs> where, would, where would that be? It's in Andros. It's a, one of the islands in the Bahamas off the coast of Florida. It's wonderful. Set your clock back, and you come back all refreshed and ready to go. And bright eyed and bushy tail. Take part in picks of the week. <laughs> stress? No, no stress. No herpes reactivation. Ah, uh, you know, there's some stress. There's a lot of UVB radiation yeah, stress that's that right. you get from You're just standing out in the front of a boat. <laughs> Science blog of the week is called BioCurious, ah. a web blog about biology and physics, grad school, and miscellaneous other things through the eyes of physicists by a bunch of grad students up uh, in the Northeast. Nice. So my pick of the week is last night I went with my daughter and my wife to a uh, sort of a warehouse in uh, in Brooklyn and attended the Secret Science Club. Oh, I give a talk at that. And I had just the best time. <laughs> That's There's great. a guy from Brown who's a geologist who talked about the experiments they're running on Mars and comparing them to experiments they're running in Antarctica. So uh, if you're in the New York area and you really are interested in science. This is a place to go. They bring in 
really terrific people. Even Dick went and did it. It's true. And uh, <laughs> great, great, au- great audience that's just interested in learning something about uh, the world. It's, it's the only lecture I ever gave that they actually shoved a beer in my hand beforehand, and they said, you, you have to drink this before you talk. And I felt I was in a comedy club rather than a <laughs> science lecture. I had the most wonderful time. It was a, it's a great, I highly recommend it. I, I totally approve of it. Wait, Listen. I thought we did that at the microbiology retreat. <laughs> That's a different kind of club. That's right. This is the lay public that comes in to learn about science. It's a wonderful opportunity. What's the name, what's the name again? Secret Science Club. All right, That's I'll right. find the website. We'll put a link. They've got it. Absolutely. Sounds up. good. Up. Brooklyn. I have another pick of the week. Also, it's called the. It's called the. Uh, hmm. Oh, brother! I just had it. Dick, you have to remember your picks of the week. No, I just. All right, let me let it. me I'll, go I'll through it. All right, our science podcast of the week is Science Friday, which is an NPR podcast. I've been listening to this for a while, and it's pretty good. Uh, weekly discussion of news in science, technology, health, and environment with interviews and listener questions. Sort of like us, oh, right? I remembered my pick of the week. Yeah, it's it's called Radio week? Laboratory. Radio Laboratory. Yeah, it's an NPR show on Fridays at noon on NPR, at least in New York City, and uh, it's fantastic. They cover the broadest, widest to- topic subjects you can possibly do they, imagine. Uh, were you on that today? I was. So that do won't they be, ma- It won't be aired until September. Do they make podcasts out of them, or are they just live broadcasts? They're live broadcasts, but they advertise podcasts that are of interest. So I gave them this week in virology to say something about it, and they would love to do that. So maybe we'll get some fair play returns. All right. Very good. And my science book of the week, I gave a lecture on uh, Tuesday at Rockefeller, and after the lecture, a young man gave me a book, a young man by the name of David, who's probably listening, <laughs> he gave me a book called A Conspiracy of Cells. Oh. And I started reading it in the subway on the way back here. <laughs> it's fabulous. It's about HeLa cells. It has a little bit about how they were made. Back but to then, Henrietta. Back to Henrietta. But then, basically, it's about how they contaminated everything <laughs> and everywhere, every cell line. And it starts more or less in the 70s when Nixon started his crusade against cancer. Sounds like Sendai virus. <laughs> and part of that was a detente, a scientific detente with the Soviet Union, and they gave us six cell lines, which they said had cancer viruses, and they were all HeLa cells. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> it, it all had papillomavirus. So this is a great book. It's out of press, unfortunately, and it's hard to find at a reasonable price. But I thank you, David, for giving that to me, and it's a, it's a good pick. Great. So don't forget, if you go over to sciencepodcasters.org or promednetwork.com, that's where you can find TWIV, besides the usual place, twiv.tv. And there are lots of other science podcasts there. They're always adding new ones. So if you like science, check it out. Remember, we're going to be live at ASM General Meeting in Philadelphia, Tuesday, May 19th at 2 p.m. We'll post uh, exactly where we're going to be. And if you can't be there, then you can watch us being streamed live on the internet. We'll send a link for that when it's uh, available pretty soon. Me and Dick and Alan and Raul Andino will join us. Really? He's going to be at the meeting, so he's agreed wow. to talk with us on stage in front of a live audience. Oh, that's frightening. <laughs> Maybe they'll give us beers. Maybe they will. We'll probably Before need them. Try. Or something even stronger. <laughs> a couple of you have responded to my request last time to write a review on iTunes. Thanks very much. Please write some more. We're trying to move on to the featured front page on iTunes. I think we have three or four reviews. So it's just write a sentence, and I think the more reviews we have there, the easier it is to move up. Yeah, it doesn't actually even matter what you say. <laughs> well, you should say a good thing, or you could say, I don't understand anything Dick says. Right. right. Well, neither does Dick, so that's neither not the problem. Dick. <laughs> so you can follow us on Twitter, which is, of course, the microblogging platform, twitter.com. You could follow Twiv. We have two different Twivs, P-R-O-F-V-R-R and Alan Dove, and we tend to give out interesting virology and science tidbits throughout the day. But do send us your questions like you always do at twiv at twiv.tv. We're always interested to hear them. Uh, we have a big backlog of questions, and we were thinking of doing an episode just on email. Oh, that sounds great. So maybe we'll do that. Letters. We have letters. We have lots and lots of letters. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember that from to, the Perry Como show? Per, no, I didn't, I didn't listen to Perry. <laughs> he was Italian, too, yeah. Now, uh, we will not be back next week, folks. We're taking a spring break. We are. TWIV is on spring break next week. We'll be back the following week. 
You might say TWIV will be latent next week. Yeah, TWIV will be latent. <laughs> For a week. Uh, right. But the following week, we'll which, is, which is which is tax week, April 15th, we are having a session on SARS. I have a SARS person lined up for really? that week, yes. So, Dick, you're going to be there. I know Alan sure. will be there. Yep. That will be a Thursday. April, well. 16th. April 16th. Everybody knows that date, right? <laughs> That's when we're recording, and right. then we'll put Black it up over Thursday, the weekend. It's cold. <laughs> so, as Dick says, you know, TWIV will be latent until then. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Saul. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, and, Vince. Uh, sorry about the mix-up, Alan. That's all right. But we still got enough Alan fix for yeah. the week. <laughs> Dick, thank you very much. Good to see you. Tan Dick. Uh, it's good You've to be back. You've been listening to the podcast about viruses. Uh, do join us again in two weeks. In the meantime, listen to all the back episodes. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>